Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Nick Kaiser. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Florida where my lab studies behavioral disease ecology. So we're interested in um, studying infectious diseases through the lens of animal behavior. And we're mostly interested in how individual traits, uh, individual differences in behavioral traits can influence uh, patterns at larger scales of biological organization. So social groups, populations, and communities. So it's not surprising that one phenomenon that I've always been interested in is collective behaviors. So these are some of the most awe-inspiring biological phenomena on the planet. They're the coordinated, organized, or directed actions or sometimes emergent properties of social groups um, that are unachievable by solitary individuals. But it's important to remember uh, two really important factors are that groups in the same population can differ from one another consistently in their collective behaviors and that these, difference can be, these differences can be the product of the traits of individual group members. So one thing that unites collective behavior research and in infectious disease research is that they're both inherently multi-scale phenomena. For example, in uh, the collective migration of bird flocks, the traits and experiences of individuals may predict their role in that group. And in disease outbreaks, host traits can influence infection risk and transmission potential and uh, end up driving epidemiological dynamics at the population level. So individual traits influence collective outcomes and group traits influence individual outcomes. And one of my favorite examples of this relationship between individual traits, collective behavior, and disease outbreaks uh, is this long-term study by Sapolsky and Cher, where they observed a troop of olive baboons. Uh, and in the 80s, some of these aggressive males in the troop began utilizing urban trash heaps as a novel food source and subsequently died of bovine tuberculosis infections. Um, this left behind a cohort of non-aggressive survivors, and the, that behavioral culture of non-aggression has persisted far past the point at which all of the males in the group had been replaced. Another cool example is shoal formation in banded killifish. Uh, so when the majority of individuals in a shoal are uninfected, these killifish will swim in this processional style uh, shoal that have this sort of like elliptical shape. Uh, but when the majority of individuals are infected with these skin insisting trematode parasites, they show this more phalanx like shoal uh, with a indivi more individuals at the leading edge. And this uh, shape of the shoal can affect things like food availability for different individuals, um, navigational potential and the potential uh, uh, for predation risk. So one of the systems that I've used to study the relationship between collective behaviors and disease is the social spider Stegodiphus demicola. Uh, so these spiders live in permanent family groups of dozens uh, to sometimes hundreds of individuals where they engage in collective prey capture, cooperative web building, and even cooperative parental care. So when a prey item uh, enters the web, oftentimes these can even be high risk intruders like this predatory ant. An individual will leave the retreat to go engage with that prey item after which more colony mates will be recruited to the event and they'll co-envenomate and co-feed on the prey item. So one cool thing about this system is that we can study the collective uh, prey capture ability of groups by vibrating a piece of paper in the capture web to simulate a struggling prey item. And then we record things like how rapidly the group attacks, how many individuals are attacking, which individuals are attacking in this sort of controlled repeatable uh, stimulus and setting. So to study how uh, microbial transmission occurs within colonies, I've used 16S sequencing approaches to uncover the microbial communities that we could find in their webs and on their cuticles. But we also use culture-based methods to collect a number of these bacteria in situ to do manipulative experiments. Uh, so we use these naturally occurring bacteria as models of microbial transmission by transforming them with plasmids so they can grow in selective growth media and fluoresce under UV light. So then we can track the transmission of this sort of introduced strain of bacteria. So now I'm gonna to try to uh, show some combined re results from a number of different studies. Um, so in studying collective foraging in these spider societies, we know that a fast response is really important, whether it's defending against dangerous intruders or overwhelming large prey. Uh, so here is a frequency distribution of 37 colonies from the field uh, containing individuals which vary in their risk tolerance. Uh, so this is an individual level behavioral trait, behavioral phenotype that we often refer to as boldness. Um, 
And colonies contain colonies that contain on average more bold or risk tolerant individuals will attack prey more quickly compared to colonies with fewer bold individuals. Um, yet we see this broad variation uh, among colonies in this group composition within the same population. So if we focus on just this end of this distribution, we find that colonies attack prey two and a half times faster and with twice as many participants compared to colonies on the other end of the distribution. However, we've also found that these colonies experience twice the rate of bacterial transmission um, relative to other group compositions. And if those are pathogenic bacteria, then this sets up a clear trade-off between these two collective outcomes. So of course, trade-offs and collective outcomes are not a new phenomenon. Um, there's a well-known example of the speed accuracy trade-off in collective decision-making, where groups can either make rapid but inaccurate choices or slower choices with higher accuracy. Uh, there's also this really classic example of infection uh, information trade-offs, where pathogens and information can be transmitted among individuals simultaneously. And this new paper by Evans et al. shows that the structure of the underlying social network can actually alter the relationship between those two outcomes, which is pretty neat. Um, but moving forward, we're going to just use a hypothetical example. So in this case, let's say groups containing more aggressive individuals will outperform groups with fewer aggressives in terms of collective foraging. Also, parasites are transmitted via aggressive interactions. And the cost associated with parasitism outweighs the benefits garnered from collective foraging. So under these circumstances, we would predict that in the presence of parasites, the optimal group composition should shift from aggressive dominated to a mixture of aggressive and docile uh, individuals. Uh, so here's this idea that I've developed, which I'm calling the social fulcrum hypothesis of group composition. So that is group composition or the mixture of different phenotypes in the group is a fulcrum upon which groups can balance different conflicting outcomes like outbreak risk and collective foraging. So in the presence of parasites, when outbreak risk increases, groups should shift towards less aggressive group compositions to counteract the disease risk, even at the expense of collective foraging. So the optimal group composition changes depending on parasite risk. Um, so this could show up in a number of different ways. Uh, first, as the product of historical selection, we may find a negative relationship, uh, for example, between local parasite density and the percentage of aggressive individuals in the group because different subpopulations vary in the optimal group composition based on differences in local parasite pressure sort of like the geographic mosaic theory um, of, of co-evolution. Um, secondly, groups may actively shift their phenotypic composition in the presence of parasites. So it might be a numerical response, like we saw with the baboons, where aggressive individuals are more likely to die, so you end up with generally non-aggressive groups, uh, or it could be the product of phenotypic plasticity, where individuals shift their behavioral expression so that groups shift towards the more optimal mixture. All right, so I wanted to finish with uh, the idea of feedbacks between parasite transmission and collective behavior, because I think this is a pretty exciting and cool uh, uh, potential phenomenon. So in the locus that I showed in the beginning of the talk, swarming is influenced by aggregation pheromones. But in aggregations, locusts can horizontally transmit a microsporidian parasite. However, microsporidian infection acidifies the gut which suppresses hindgut bacteria that are responsible for producing that aggregation pheromone. So thereby this would uh, reduce swarming tendencies and reduce horizontal transmission. So this is a negative feedback between parasite transmission and this collective aggregation behavior. An example of a positive feedback might be chimpanzees that maintain territories via aggressive interactions. So within territories, chimpanzees accumulate locally abundant and distinct uh, parasites, and parasite load increases with levels of aggression via the immunosuppressive effects of uh, testosterone and cortisol. So this establishes a positive feedback uh, between group level aggression and within group parasite load. So I suspect that there's lots of examples like these, uh, these types of dynamics, but focusing on the relationship between individual traits, collective behavior and outbreak risk as a generalizable phenomenon could provide new ways of approaching how we predict and prevent disease outbreaks. 
Uh, so with that, I just want to thank uh, my, my current and past lab members. Uh, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me. This is really an honor to be a part of this. And here is a, a QR code uh, that you can scan to access all the raw data that I presented in this talk. Uh, thanks so much for watching.